we look back over 2018, let's look at some noteworthy moments. of a year, and you look kind of over into an upcoming year, there's lots of different feelings. For some people, the idea of looking back, because you know, a lot of us, we kind of live our lives, we're moving along, we're kind of moving at a slow pace or a quick pace, we're kind of moving this direction, and looking back involves not just kind of casting a glance over your shoulder, but looking back really involves pausing and saying, you know, what happened? What did God do? Where did God show up? What happened in my life? And as we look back at 2018, for some people... Man, some people look back and they go, man, this was, this was the year to beat all years. I mean, it was a great year. There was, there was joy and health and financial provision and closeness to Jesus. It's just been incredible. I, I know people, because as a pastor, I walk with lots of folks at Shoreline that have had an incredible year. I know one young couple who met at Shoreline uh, this, this past year. They uh, fell in love with each other. They, I did their celebration of Christian marriage last weekend. And now the government's sending them with the military off somewhere else this week, and they're gone. But their year, their, their, their year here at Shoreline was amazing. And now it's launching them. To, and some people look back and they go, man, it's been incredible. I'll just sit and kind of, oh, what a great year. Other people look and go, man, it's hard for me to even pause and really want to look back at this past year because it's just been, it's been heartache and it's been sorrow and pain. This is the year I lost someone I loved so dearly I can't even put into words. This is the year that someone very close to me went through such turmoil and pain and struggle, and I was like right there with them, and we're still, we're still in the midst of it all. For some people, you, some people don't look and go, oh, let's rejoice in 2018. Some people say, man, this has been just a hard, hard year. But for all of us, there is something in the rhythm of life, something in the way that God has designed us, and something in what the scriptures teach, something that's, that's good about the rhythm, even when it's joyful or hard, to pause and to look back, and also to pause and to look forward. And so we're going to look today at two different uh, times in the history of God's people, two different events in the Bible, one all the way back at the beginning in the book of Exodus, when God's people left their bondage in Egypt. And when God called the people out, he said, listen, I'm going to set you free from your slavery, from your bondage, from this horrible situation, and I'm going to, I'm going to part the Red Seas. I'm going to send you out with, with victory into the promised land. And, and, and God said, I'm, you know, th but here's the deal. After I do this, God says, I want you, God says, I want you to remember this every single year indefinitely going forward. Don't, don't forget to stop and look back and remember what I did. Because when we see what God did in the past, it gives us hope for what God's going to do in the future. And when we see who God was for us when he delivered, when he showed up, when he did amazing things, it lets us know who God will be for us as we go into the new year. And then we're also going to look at when Jesus establishes this time we call communion. We're going to share communion together uh, today at the end of our service. And, and we're going to look at when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, but also do this until I come again. Jesus says, remember, but also look forward to the fact that I'm coming again. This is the rhythm of a healthy, mature life. And when we look back, we show wisdom because we learn from our past. And when we look forward, we invite the power of God to propel us forward into a new year. Even when it's scary and difficult and there's still challenges from the past, God says, I will give you the strength you need to press you forward. So we're talking today about the wisdom of looking back and the power of looking forward. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Exodus chapter 12. 
And the first passage we'll look at comes from Exodus chapter 12, beginning of verse 17. It'll be on the screens, and I'll read it as well. But I want you to get the sense of this, this, this is uh, spoken by God, telling the people, I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to set you free from your bondage, out of your captivity. I'm going to do it through miracles and signs and wonders. I'm going to set you free. But I don't want you to forget what I did. So look at verse 17 of Exodus chapter 12. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread, because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. God says, remember this day when I set you free, when I showed up in power, when, when, I, when I sent you from your enemies and into a new beginning and a new future. Don't forget this day. It's when I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Let each generation remember this. Well, how do we go about doing that? Well, here's the instructions, verse 18. In the first month, you are to eat bread made without yeast, from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day, because when they went out, they were told to eat bread that was kind of packed, you know, packed quick, go, and you remember what you did then so you can remember what I did then, God is saying. Verse 19, for seven days, no yeast is to be found in your houses. And anyone, and this seems really severe, and anyone, whether foreigner or native born, who eats anything with yeast in it, must be cut off from the community of Israel. You become cut off from the people if you don't follow this instruction. Eat nothing made with yeast, Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. It's an interesting passage. God is saying, I want you to remember when I had you packed quickly and you ate, you ate unleavened bread and you headed out in victory and in freedom. But now, year after year after year after year, go through the same routine and eat the, uh, eat the unleavened bread again for seven days. There, there's something about tastes and smells that take us back to moments. There's certain foods you eat, it's like, oh man, it takes you right back to junior, oh man, junior high, we used to have those as a snack, or you smell something, it takes you back there. And so, so God says, listen, I want you to, to, to do certain behaviors, have certain tastes, certain memories, certain timing every year for a week, and this is serious business, this remembering. You slow down, and you look back, and you remember. And I really wondered when I was reading this, you know, why God so severe? Boy, if you eat, eat stuff with leaven in it, you're cutting yourself off from the people. You go, man, that seems pretty severe. But as I thought about it, and, I, and those are the kind of passages, a lot of pastors go, well, I'll just, I'll just stop after verse 18, and we'll skip that part, because it's kind of, you know, it kind of jumps out at you. It's kind of a little severe. But here's what I think is going on. I think God is saying, when you forget where you've been, you forget who you are. If you're part of my people, you remember where you came from. Because where you came from helped form who you are today. God is saying it's serious business if you forget to remember your past. Even the tough parts. You see, because they're remembering that God led them out of Egypt. But what was Egypt? It was a place of bondage and slavery. Remember not only the hard things, but God was the one who took you through the hard things and delivered you into the future. Why do you need to remember that? Because you know what? You're going to hit another hard time. And in the next hard time, you have to remember that God is a God who delivers. So when you hit this new time, as you go into 2019, and you hit a difficult time, you can say, but wait a minute. I can look back at my life, and I can see here, 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 here. God showed up. God delivered. God took care of me. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm going to be okay. Because the same God is with me. And for some of you, you're in places right now that seem dark and difficult. And you say, I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Man, 2018 was tough, and 2019 starting tough. But God says, remember that I am the God who delivers. So wise people look back. And we're wise and look back to some things. There's some things we should do. Wise people look back and rejoice. There is something amazing about looking back and saying, look at what God did. Look how he showed up in my marriage. Look at how he helped my family. Look how he provided for us. Look how he watched over our church. Wise people look back and say, Thank you, God, that you showed up. Thank you for what you've done. A wise church looks back and says, look at the people who came to know Jesus this year. Look at the middle school ministry that's just blossoming at Shoreline. Praise God for that. Look at the steps we've taken forward with our, our courtyard and with space for our youth. We're, we're moving forward. God, thank you for what you've done in the past. We want to give you celebration as we move forward into the future. So wise people then pray. Here's a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for your goodness. Man, it's good just as, as you're going through the day. Dear God, thank you for your goodness to Shoreline Church. Thank you that you've led us through another year. You've provided for us. Thank you that, by the way, I'm praying right now. Uh, 
That's allowed. I'm not even closing my eyes. Neither are you. Boy, you're in trouble now for not closing your eyes when you pray. No, you can, we can just talk with God. God, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for how you've led, Lord. Thank you for how you've protected my family. Thank you, Lord, that though we maybe don't have everything we want, we've had everything we needed. God, you've been good. Wise people look back and notice and give celebration to God. As I was thinking about that, and as I was thinking about Shoreline Church, I thought of kind of the story of this congregation. About 25 years ago, God called Pastor Howie Hugo and his wife Linda and their family to come to Monterey and to start a church. They kind of felt called to start a church for people that didn't like going to church. That was kind of the thinking at the very beginning. People that just aren't used to all that real super churchy stuff, but they wanted to get to know Jesus. And, and the mission of Shoreline Church, before I came as the pastor 10 years ago, the mission was to help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. That was the mission of Shoreline Church. And when I became pastor here, a lot of times new pastors are like, well, we're gonna come up with a new mission. I'm the new pastor. We're gonna have a new pastor's mission. I read, help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. I went, yep, that's it. So we just kept it, right? To help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. That's the vision of Shoreline Church. It has been from the beginning. So about seven years ago, we began looking at Shoreline and saying, okay, we're, we're reaching people in our community with Jesus, but we want to help other churches do the same thing. We think we can help other churches do, because you know, churches really exist to do only three things. Churches exist to glorify God, to grow believers, and to share God's love with the world. That's it. Just those, you know, glorify God upward, love God's family and grow in faith together inward, and then outward with the love of Jesus. So Shoreline seven years ago said, we want to take a next step and help other churches learn to reach out into the community because most churches want to do that and don't know how to. So you got to get this. Seven years ago in the living room of somebody from Shoreline Church here, I met with seven pastors from other churches around the area that wanted to be trained to help their church reach out better. And we, and we trained seven churches seven years ago to, to learn how to really go out with the message of Jesus and share God's love. And I kind of thought to myself, I thought, what if each of those pastors and their churches, if they touch their own church and their community and they reach 150 people, that's like over 1,000 people that are gonna learn more about Jesus. Thought, that's pretty good. That's pretty amazing. So the next year, we did another one of these two-day intensive trainings around what we call organic outreach, about reaching out with the love of Jesus. And the next year, we had 14 leaders that got trained from around here and some from out of state. The next year, we moved it out of that living room because that living room wasn't big enough, and we had 41 leaders who we trained to go out and help their churches reach their community with the message of Jesus the way Shoreline's mission has been from the beginning. We're helping other churches get that vision and step into it. In 2018, okay, we're going to pause, look back. In 2018, we trained leaders from all over the globe. We trained this is, the, this is the same training that we started with seven people seven years ago. In 2018, 1,188 leaders were trained in a 12-hour, two-day training. Yeah, praise God for that, yeah. And if my math is right, if each of those leaders impacts about 150 people in their community, that's about 178,200 people doing a better job sharing the love of Jesus. Amen. That's you. That's your church. Now, I got to tell you another story. In this training, we've had churches come to us, groups of churches from India, Sri Lanka, Guatemala, around the world. They've come to us right this next year. We're doing training in April in, in, in uh, Australia. We have churches coming now and groups of churches from all over the world coming and saying, will you send a team from Shoreline to teach us how to reach our community better? Because we, do we do a good job of glorifying God. We do a good job of growing Christians, but we don't do a very good job of reaching out with the love of Jesus. And so, so this last year, we sent a team from Shoreline Church to India and to Sri Lanka. Now, if you're a church in India and Sri Lanka, you don't have money to, to pay to bring a team from California over there to train your people. And so who paid for it? You did. You guys say thank you. Because, you because, because your giving allowed us to go and train leaders. And, and this was amazing. So we had this team of three of our leaders go, and they did, I think, five or six trainings in India, and then one in Sri Lanka. And we had another team go to Guatemala. And I was with the team going to that. We were kind of going all over the place doing training this year. So this team that went to India and Sri Lanka, they got to the first place they were training. And, they started, and there was a nice group of pastors there, and they, they had a translator. They started doing the training. And about a half an hour into the training, all of the different pastors stopped paying attention to the training and got on their phones and started making phone calls, which seems kind of rude when you're speaking and people start making phone calls. That's kind of a rude thing, right? 
So the person speaking said, I'm sorry, is something wrong? Why, why are you all on your phones? Through a translator, they explained. They said, you don't understand. They said, just recently in India, it was made on a national level illegal to proselytize, to evangelize, to share Jesus. We're not allowed to do this anymore. And so we thought we can't share Jesus anymore in our nation because their idea of evangelism was going on street corners and preaching on street corners, and that's illegal now. They didn't have any other idea of how to do evangelism. They said, as you've been explaining what you're teaching us for the first half an hour, they said, we can do this. We can still reach our nation with a message of Jesus. We can still reach out with the love of Jesus. We can do it relationally, organically, the way you're, they said, this will work. And then they explained, the only reason we came to this training is that the pastor who we respect invited us. We came to respect, honor that pastor. We didn't think you were gonna teach us, any, us anything that would help us. But what you're teaching, it will work. We can reach our nation with the message of Jesus now if you'll just keep teaching us. So what, what, what are they doing? What were they doing? They were calling other pastors, saying, you gotta come right now. This will work. We can still share Jesus with our nation. And the other pastors started coming. Now here's what's funny. The pastor who was hosting the event said, well, all these other pastors haven't paid and they didn't have any money. And so this pastor who was hosting it said, you know, they, they didn't pay, they can't come in. Our team came and you know what our team told them? You'll pay for it. They, they, said, they, they, said, they said, Shoreline will pay for it. Don't turn anyone away. This happened at every single training through India and a training in Sri Lanka. Pastors were calling other pastors saying, you've got to come right now. We can still reach out with the message of Jesus. And in February of this coming year, there's a training we're going to be doing in Kansas that has over 4,000 pastors at one training. That's your church. Dear God, we look back and we say thank you and we bless you for your goodness. Keep using us as a church. Pour us out, Lord. Use our resources for the places in the world who have less than nothing. Lord, we will invest in the work of your kingdom because you are multiplying churches that share the love of Jesus like we do here at Shoreline. Thank you for all the good things you've done this last year. We celebrate and we give you praise. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. I'm not done yet, though. <laughs> Wise people look back to notice. Wise people, they're walking through life, they're moving along, but wise people stop and they just look back and they just notice. Boy, God protected there. God provided there. Wise people actually look back at their last year and they say, oh God. And sometimes God removes the veil and you can see where he really protected you. Sometimes we don't even know until one day we see him face to face and we're gonna have the veil pulled back and we're like, man, I could have died 50 times. I who knows what, you know, God's protecting, God's providing. But wise people look back and they notice what God is doing and then they cry out, dear Lord, your provision and your presence are amazing. Wise people say, God, you have provided, you have protected, you have been with us. Wise people look back, and in the great moments and the painful moments, they say, oh, God, you have been with us. You've never let us go. We have been under the shadow of your hand. We give you praise. That's what wise people do. They notice the presence and the glory of God. Do you slow down enough to look back and say, God, you're amazing. You're still with us. I had a chance in the middle of 2018 to go to, uh, to, go to uh, Portland, Oregon, and to speak, uh, to train a group of pastors in evangelism. And, and I was speaking, there was one other speaker, and this guy named Luis Palau. That he, I spoke first, he spoke second. And I'd never spoken with Louis, Luis Palau before. People call him the, the, the Billy Graham of Latin America. He's an evangelist who's, who still travels all over the world. But he shared, as, as I taught first, and he got up to teach, he said, you know, many of you have asked about my health. And he said, at the end of last year, I was told I have stage four lung cancer and I won't live. He was actually told he wouldn't live until that, even to that point where we were teaching, middle of this last year. So he said, I want to let you all know that by this Christmas, I will celebrate my first Christmas face to face with Jesus. I won't be here anymore. I'm going to be with Jesus. But this Christmas, Luis spent Christmas with his son Kevin and his son Andrew who are now running the ministry. This, this a couple months ago, he, was, not, he was, was supposed to go and speak in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Luis went and spoke at a big festival and event there. And he spent this Christmas with his family and he hasn't gone to be with Jesus yet. Sometimes you look back and say, look at God, I noticed something. <laughs> Everyone said this, but look what you did. So for Luis Palau, he's saying, God, I noticed that you've spared my life for one more Christmas with my family. Maybe next Christmas I'll celebrate it face to face with Jesus. Maybe not. That's up to God. But you notice where God's at work. And we thank God for his amazing presence. Wise people look back, and here's the third thing. 
Why should people look back to learn? Why should people look back and they say, I'm going to learn from this last year? Sometimes I'm going to say this. Here's my prayer sometimes. Dear Lord, ouch, never again. Lord, I made a bad choice. I made a bad decision. I didn't live the way. I, I said I wouldn't live that way, talk that way, be that way. And another year, I live in that way again. God, I'm sorry. I repent. Why should people learn from their mistakes and say, I'm going to turn around now in the power of Jesus. And I'm going to move into the, new, the future living more for him. Receiving God's grace for the past but moving forward into the future, holding the hand of Jesus. Wise people will, will actually look back and see the mistakes and the wrong steps and even their sins and lay them at the feet of Jesus and move forward, freed by the grace of Jesus. And wise people will look back and learn by saying, wow, let's do that again. <laughs> that was great. You know, so wise people can look back and say, you know, at the start of last year, I said, I don't know God's word very well. So I'm going to try to open up God's book every day, read a page or two or 10 pages or a small port or a bit, but I'm going to try to open this book every day and say, God, teach me your wisdom, give me your power, guide my life. And they look back and say, man, wow, God, I, I read your book more than I ever have any year in my life, and I am wiser and stronger, and I love you more, and now let's do it again. In 2019, I want to go deeper than I've ever been before. Wise people notice the big steps forward and say, Lord, keep moving me forward. Like the people of Israel in the Exodus, we look back and say, look what God did. And regularly, we pause and remember, because when we remember, we can be propelled into the future. So looking forward, and there's a great picture of this at the communion table, when we come to receive communion. If you have your Bibles, look with me at 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23. And this passage is talking about remembering when we come to the table and remember the bread that was broken for us, the blood that was shed, the body, and the blood of Jesus. Why should people remember, but also they look forward to what lies ahead? Watch both of those come out in this passage. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember me, Jesus says. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Remember the price he paid. Remember what he did. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, now watch this, you proclaim the Lord's death, what does it say? Until he comes. When we remember well, we're propelled in the power of Jesus into our future. Because the one whose body was broken and whose blood was shed and who paid the price, he died, he rose, and he's present, and he's coming again. So we look forward into the future. So when we walk looking forward, we walk in the power of Jesus. Number one, we walk in God's power when we look forward and pray, Lord, help. When, when, when we look forward and we say, God, I'm looking forward, I pray for your help. Here's the prayer. Dear Lord, I need your power. You ready for this? I can't make it on my own. Should we pray that one together? Let's say that out loud again. Here we go. Ready? Dear Lord, I need your power. I can't make it on my own. And when you think you can make it on your own, you're fooling yourself. We should pray that about everything that lies ahead of us. Man, at times we think, I got it now. I'm in charge now. That's when we fall on our face. Lord, I need your help. God, I look, I look at my financial situation and it's upside down and sideways and confused and I need your help. Lead me, empower me, guide me. God, I look at this relationship that was so good and beautiful and now it's so upside down and twisted and I can't untangle it. Oh God, I need your help. Help me to be humble. Help me to do my part. God, I look at our church and I look at all you're calling us to do and I look at the vision you've given for Shoreline that's way too big for us. We need your help to accomplish all you want us to accomplish as a church. And we say, Jesus, help us. Spirit, fill us. Father, guide us. Give us power. We need your help. Amen? Amen. Pray that prayer often. A wise person says, I need the power of God as I look forward. And God will show up in amazing ways. A second way we walk in power when we look forward. We walk in God's power when we look forward and plan. Lord, lead us. 
There's something about planning, about thinking ahead that I think is so godly and so honoring to Jesus. Here's the prayer. Dear Lord, shine light in the darkness and show me the way. Some people think, well, if I'm following Jesus, it just here's what it looks like, following Jesus. I just kind of wander along, oh, put all fingers on, we'll see how it goes, and just kind of just wandering around. No, no, man, Jesus, he can give a vision and a calling, and we have to pursue that. Now, I'm a bit of an advanced planner, okay? I've planned all the services, all of the preaching for all of 2019 and into 2020, 2020 already. So I'm kind of an advanced planner. Um, but here's the thing, and, and that's been through six months of prayer and interacting with about 100 leaders at our church talking and working on it together. But if something comes up and God says, this is in the direction for this week, we'll throw that sermon out and do something different. I'm ready to respond with the Spirit any moment. But there's something about planning and saying, God, I know where you're leading us. I know what you're calling us to do. I look at that 1,188 leaders that we trained this last year, and God's going to multiply that again this year. That doesn't happen by accident. Say, God, in your power, let us plan, let us prepare, let us pray, and let us follow your spirit into what you want us to do, and God will stretch us beyond what we can do, and we've got to go back to the first prayer, God, help us, we can't do it on our own. I want to challenge you as you go into the new year to ask God to lead you to a deeper place of spiritual growth. See, this is the time of the year where people you know, go, go to the, all the usual suspects of all of our, of our resolutions and what I'm going to do in the coming year. How many pounds to lose, how many, how many hours to exercise, and that's all fine. What if every one of us in the coming year said that one of the, the, the main thing I'm going to focus on is what it means to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and let him add the rest to me? What if I take my next step in my spiritual growth with Jesus? You say, well, what, what's my next step? I want to introduce you to something that, that well, if you haven't done this, we've had a couple hundred people do this, a few hundred, but I want to challenge you to do something. If you look on the screen here, you go to the Shoreline website. Top right, it says right there, it says spiritual growth assessment. If you click on that link, what's going to pop up is this. It's a questionnaire you can do in about 10 to 15 minutes. And it looks at seven areas of spiritual growth. My growth in God's word, my growth in prayer, my growth in community, my growth in generosity, my growth in sharing the love of Jesus, my growth in, my growth in sacrificial service, my growth in, in, in character that looks like Jesus. The, the, the things the Bible says, this is what it looks like to grow as a Christian. That survey is designed to, in about 15 minutes, allow you to do that. When you hit submit, it immediately gives you results. It just pops up on your screen right there, all the results. And what you can do is find the one or two that you're the most, you're growing, those seven areas of spiritual growth, you're growing the most in, and say, thank you, Jesus, let me keep doing great in that. And then here's my challenge to you. Then you go to the worst one. It scores from 1% to 100% how you're doing. You say, okay, I'm only I'm, you know, 60% on these ones, and I'm like 5% on this one. You find the toughest, worst one in your life. And say, oh God, this year I follow Jesus in this area. If it says, man, prayer is my weakest area, you say, man. And then, it gives, then what happens when it pops up, it gives you four or five ways to grow in that area in the new year. So where do you get something like that? Well, at Shoreline Church, we made it just for you. And if you click on there, the one spot, if you fill in and say, I want a pastor to talk with me, you can do that and it'll, it'll send it to our pastors. Otherwise, it's totally anonymous. It's just for you. And if you fill that, and, you, and here's my challenge. You find the area of the seven areas of spiritual growth where you're the lowest and say, man, by the end of this year, it's going to be my strongest. I'm, I'm going after Jesus this year. And if, and if it says my weak area is God's word, you dig into God's word. And if it says my weak area is joyful generosity, you learn to give this year. If it says my weak area is sacrificial service, you find a place to serve. You get the point? And there's four or five areas on each area to grow and steps to take. I want to challenge you in this coming year and say, Lord, shine light in the darkness and show me the way to walk with you. And then third and finally, we walk in God's power when we look forward and pursue. Lord, show up. We cry out to God, Lord, will you show up? Will you do what you want to do? Lord, Lord dear Lord, I will seek you and your kingdom will. God, I'm going to seek first your kingdom. I'm going to seek your righteousness. The first thing in my life is going to be to seek Jesus. If you will do that first, he will take care of the rest. Why do I say that? Listen to Matthew 6, 31 to 33. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Seek him first this year. Make your highest priority growing to be more like Jesus. And watch him take care of the rest.
Watch him show up in powerful ways. Final challenge today before we come to the table. I want to challenge you to have more spiritual conversations with more Christians in the new year. I want to challenge you that when you're with another Christian, you will not just talk about sports teams and the weather and your job and your income and the pain in the back, neck, or hip, wherever. You know, that you'll talk about, that you'll, but you'll talk about the journey of growing to be more like Jesus over and over with other Christians. So well, how, how would I, what do I, what do I say? What do I talk about? I'm glad you asked. Here are seven questions that are on our website. You, don't know, you can take a picture of the screen if you want to. It'll be on two slides, but it's all on the website. Every, the outline for my sermon every week is on the website. You can download it and have all those notes. But here's seven questions you can ask other people. By the way, they're about the seven areas that show our spiritual maturity. Here's question one. What is one way you're striving to become more like Jesus? Can you, if you're talking with someone, hey, can you share, what's one way you're striving to become more like, I'm not going to ask you to respond right now, but you know, we can have a conversation about that. That would be a great conversation, right? I'm trying to be more like Jesus in this, and talk about it together. Here's the second question. What is God teaching you as you read the Bible? Hey, God, what's God teaching you as you read the Bible? You go, I don't know if I can ask someone that because that presumes you're reading the Bible, that presumes you're learning, and that presumes you want to tell me about it. <laughs> it's a lot of presumption. I want you to presume that with me. I want some of you this year to say, Pastor Kevin, what are, you what are you learning? Not when you study for your sermons. What are you learning each morning when you get up and you sit before Jesus and you read the Bible just for Jesus and Kevin? What's God teaching you? And I'll tell you what he's teaching me. But I'll look at you and I'll say, what's God teaching you? Can we start talking that way? Do we? I think we should. I think we need to. Here's another question. What helps you communicate with God through your day? What helps you talk with God? What helps you pray deeper through your day? Talk about it. How are you connecting with God's people in deeper ways? How are you growing in Christian community? How is God calling you to serve other people with humility? How are you growing to serve like Jesus served? What steps of generosity are you taking, and how is God using this for his glory? How are you growing more generous, and how is God being glorified through your generosity? I love this question. Who is one person you love that is still far from Jesus? And how can I pray for you as you shine the light of Jesus? Can we talk about these things with other Christians? Should we? What's the answer? Yes. Yeah, way more than we do. So let's start having these conversations. There's wisdom to looking back. There's power in looking forward. And, and, and in just a moment, we're going to come to the table, and we're going to celebrate this, this very thing that Jesus taught us about, uh, about coming to the table and taking the bread and taking the cup and remembering, remembering what he did, but anticipating what he's going to do. Remembering who he was, but knowing who he is as he leads us forward. And so in just a moment, the ushers are gonna begin to pass the elements. If you're here in the worship center or the family worship venue, and you are a follower of Jesus, you've come to the cross, you've confessed your sins, and you've received Jesus Christ as your savior. This is the table of Jesus, and you're welcome at this table. You may come from another church tradition, but if you've received Jesus Christ, and he is your Savior and the one leading your life, he invites you to this table. So when the elements come to you, please take those and receive them. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, or maybe if you have a son or daughter or a grandchild with you that isn't a Christian yet, just pass the elements by, because it doesn't, this really doesn't make sense unless you know what it means. And so if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, just pass the elements by, but I want to encourage you to watch the people around you, because this is powerful for us. It's at this table that we remember what Jesus has done and we're assured of what he will do in our future. I want to ask the ushers to begin passing the elements and when they come to you, will you take the bread and the cup, will you hold them and hold on to them? I'll invite us to partake a little bit later after the song just as a sign of our unity in Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to listen to this song or if you want you to sing along, look back and remember where God's, what God's done this last year. Look forward to the coming year. Hold the elements in your hand and remember the presence and the power of Jesus. Let's prepare to come to the table together.
take the bread of life broken for all my sin your body crucified to make me whole again i will recall the cup poured out in sacrifice to trade this sinner's end for your salvation's road with fear and trembling your way born as my own as Christ is formed in me person in this room or the family worship venue or online but I know there's been moments of incredible glory and hope and beauty to remember and there's been moments of deep pain 
and loss and sorrow, confusion for all of us. But Jesus, whose body was broken and whose blood was shed, was there with you through it all and will be with you in the new year and until we see him face to face. Around that table at the first communion, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember his presence, his glory, his goodness, and the hope you find in him. As a sign of our unity in Christ, let's partake of the bread together. same night Jesus took the cup he said this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins every time you do this Jesus said do this in remembrance of me we remember the price that he paid the life that he gave the burden of our sin that he bore and we remember the glory of the resurrection the hope of the second coming and that he is with us already going ahead of us into the new year. As we partake of the cup, let's remember Jesus. And Lord Jesus Christ, I can't think of a better way to finish a year and start a new year than with your people here. Among your family, your church, remembering your goodness, learning from the pain and the hard things, and looking forward, Lord Jesus, to a new year that you've already gone ahead of us. Among our thoughts and prayers and goals for the new year, Lord, may our first and greatest goal be to grow to be more like you, to love more like Jesus, to serve more like Jesus, to live more like Jesus. Fill us with your power as we go into this new year. And thank you for this gift of your life and your death and your resurrection. We pray this, Jesus, in your name and for your glory.